Doctors could be on the brink of a breakthrough. Migraines. How to control them. Tame a migraine. A severe migraine. Throbbing, recurring headaches. Given all the noise, navigating the migraine experience can be confusing and scary, but you do not have to do it alone. Welcome to the Migraine Guy podcast, the official podcast of themigraineguy.com and theheadachereview.com. Now, here's your host. What's up, podcast audience? It's Kevin here. Just wanted to let you know that this podcast, the Migraine Guy podcast, is currently the only podcast dedicated to covering, informing, and discussing headache and migraine conditions. There are some older podcasts that used to produce weekly or monthly content that have stopped, and that leaves a gap in an area that is ripe for bringing awareness to the population at large. So if you want to help bring awareness about headache and migraine conditions, make sure to leave a review of this podcast and the episodes you've listened to. The higher the rating, the higher those algorithms in the different platforms rank podcasts. And so if you like this content and want other people who are searching for podcasts to listen to, to have this podcast suggested, then go ahead and give it a five-star rating as well as a written review telling people why they should listen. Now, this isn't about me. I'm just one guy doing a little podcast trying to get some information out there. But the more people that listen to this podcast, the more people that are exposed to the information, the content that we talk about, the more people will know about headache and migraine conditions. And that is our goal. Well, it's one of our goals. The second goal is for you, the headache or migraine sufferer, to know that you are not alone. And so let's get started. All right, so for today's podcast, I had to do a little rabbit out of a hat trick because the original podcast I was wanting to do was going to be a continuation of last week's marijuana, THC, and migraine discussion. However, the uh, CBD oil that is being shipped to me shipped on Saturday. This is uh, being recorded on Wednesday, so it has not arrived yet, and so I haven't been able to test it out and get that kind of information for the podcast. So hopefully in the next week or two, probably two weeks, I want to be able to test it for a decent amount of time. Uh, Look for the CBD oil and migraine podcast. Today's podcast, since I had to scramble just a bit to get one together, is going to be something that I have a good amount of knowledge about and firsthand experience with. And that is going to be what I wish someone had told me before I started seeing doctor after doctor after doctor about my migraines. Now, This podcast is going to be somewhat critical about the medical community at large and is going to be somewhat critical about medical education and curriculum uh, at large, but that doesn't mean that medical practitioners and people that you go to see at different uh, hospitals or uh, uh, practices are in any way you know, negative or bad people or anything like that. Some of them certainly are, but some people are just always bad in every field, so that's no surprise there. The point is, is that when it comes to headache and migraine conditions, when it comes to things that matter to people who listen to this podcast, there is a big, big gap between competence and incompetence, and it doesn't get covered. That gap can't be crossed without a lot of work being done by the physicians themselves. And since most of them aren't doing that work, that means that most doctors you see are not going to know enough about your condition to be able to really help you. So this podcast is just about what you should know before you go to see your doctor. So when I say your doctor, many, many people have, you know, kind of a a primary care physician, someone they go to, they have bumps or bruises or coughs or fevers or a family doctor that you take to, you know, vaccinate your kids or talk about any sort of normal medical conditions that crop up over the years. That kind of a doctor is the one that most people go to when they start to get uh, a migraine or maybe an episodic migraine or maybe a chronic level migraine. And so things that you would normally trust them with tend to fall apart when it comes to headache or migraine. Now, of course, not trying to be blanket statement and cover all of them. Some are going to be very well informed, but they are few and far between. Well, why are they few and far between? That's a big question, a big area that needs some focus. So let's talk about a couple stats here. According to the Migraine Trust, which is a UK-based migraine advocacy group, they surveyed 
English schools, so medical schools in England, undergraduate medical schools to be specific, and found that 75% of those undergraduate schools had zero pieces of curriculum directed towards headache teaching. So if you're an undergraduate medical student in England, there's a three out of four chance that the school you're going to is not going to have anything to teach you about headache conditions. And that seems like a pretty glaring issue, big, big problem over there in England. Now, of course, to some degree, it makes some sense. Undergraduate versus graduate medical schools certainly have different curriculum. You need to get a base level uh, you need to get some base level information in the undergraduate before you can move on to the uh, probably more technical stuff involved at the graduate level. But the very fact that there isn't even a single day or an hour or a subsection of a section of a textbook devoted to talking about headache conditions shows somewhat about the priority that's placed on headache conditions in that country. But that's the UK, that's England. Let's come back to the States. Uh, a couple years ago in 2015, there was a survey that was conducted. Now, there were only 120 physicians selected for the survey, and of those 120 physicians, only 83 actually responded to the survey. So it's probably not uh, you know, the best sample size from which we can generalize about, but of those 83 that did respond, the results were pretty shocking. I'm gonna paraphrase and quote a bit here from portions of the study. So let's see. Physician, this is going to be a quote, physicians do not know the indications for when an MRI is warranted. Some physicians would order one, an MRI that is, for a new type of headache. So a headache that comes on all of a sudden. 31% would order one for a worsening headache. So if you have normal headaches to some degree and they get worse, they would order an MRI. Whereas even other doctors uh, would order one for a headache that wasn't responsive to any typical treatment that they would give. So this is a real uh, glaring issue because what it means is that about a third of doctors you go see, at least of the 83 that responded, would do one treatment plan with an MRI. The other third, another third, would do an entirely different treatment plan with an MRI, and yet the final third would do a very, very different treatment plan with an MRI. And so there isn't any uniformity, there isn't any plan, there any, isn't any protocol that these doctors are following to help use an MRI as part of an overall diagnostic, diagnostic system to help you, the headache or migraine sufferer, figure out what's going on. So that is pretty worrying. What actually was worse in this 2015 survey is the following. Only 28% of the participants in the survey were familiar with the American Academy of Neurology's guidelines on preventative treatment. That's less than a third. Uh, they probably know that the American Academy of Neurology is a thing. However, less than a third of them were familiar with the guidelines for preventative treatment. That is pretty appalling. Additionally, 79% of the participants, over two-thirds, had heard of medication overuse headache, MOH, but only 54% of the participants in the survey were aware that butylbidol-containing products can cause medication overuse headache, and only 34% in the study, uh, in the survey, were aware that narcotics can cause overuse headaches. That is utterly insane when you think about it. The fact that only half of these physicians were aware that a particular substance in very, very common pain and uh, some migraine products, uh, prescriptions, excuse me, can cause medication overuse headache. And the fact that just over a third knew that narcotics could cause medication overuse headache is terrible because that means that the prescriptions they're giving you and the treatment plans that they're discussing with you could in part be why you're having so many darn migraines and headaches. And that is a pretty big problem because you go to the doctor to get some help. And in fact, the treatment plan that they discuss with you and that you end up following could be part of the reason that your headaches continue. So there is a pretty big issue when it comes to seeing your basic doctor about headache or migraine. I'm not trying to be country specific or region specific about these stats. Global stats on this kind of information sadly are lacking. They're very lacking even in the US and England, but they're even more lacking when it comes to global stuff. However, if the U.S. and the U.K. stats are any indication, then training on migraine is probably lacking in most medical schools around 
the earth. <clears throat> around, I don't know why my voice went out. Around the earth. So uh, I'm going to put links in the show notes. Uh, if you're not familiar with show notes on a podcast, wherever you're listening, just click the information button about this podcast and you'll see a small description of what the podcast is about. And you'll also see links to the stuff that I'm quoting. So let's move on now. So now that we know that there is this widespread, we have statistics about there being widespread ignorance about headache and migraine conditions. Why do we think that that is well the first thing to keep in mind is that your primary care physician or whoever you're seeing first for your headache or migraine is only as helpful as their education is current and so if you go see a doctor who has not kept up with much research since they got out of medical school let's say 20 years ago then that means the kind of treatment plans the kind of things that they're aware of that could be causing your symptoms is 20 years dated for example, if you went and said that you were having a particular symptom set and the doctor's prescription was a tincture of mercury, you would rightly question their competence. The prescription is outdated and in fact very, very dangerous. Likewise, if the medical professional you're seeing is entirely unaware of some of the big uh, pieces of research that have come out in the last 15 to 20 years regarding migraine, then it's probably a good idea to start thinking about things that you should be doing to find a different doctor. So on the one hand, we have the fact that if they don't keep up, if the physicians don't keep up with the latest research, their knowledge is going to be dated, and in some cases, out of date. <clears throat> uh, this actually, I guess I could do a small anecdote. This actually is true. So uh, as I'm sure most of you know out there, the vascular theory, <clears throat> excuse me, the vascular theory of migraine causation is basically disproven and disregarded by people who study headache and migraine conditions. Uh, the old school thinking was that, well, there's like a neurological basis for some migraines, and then there's this vascular, this blood flow issue about other migraines. And that has largely been discounted. You can uh, all, you always see the neurological stuff. You don't always see the vascular stuff with migraine. And in fact, you can cause the vascular stuff without inducing a migraine in a person. And so a lot of these studies have dis proven the claim that there is a vascular cause to your migraine. However, I went, the second doctor that I saw when I started getting chronic migraines, <clears throat> I don't know why my voice is cutting out, excuse me, uh, I'm just getting so worked up over this, uh, the, the second doctor that I went to see about my chronic migraines looked at me and said, well, you know, there are vascular migraines and there are neurological migraines, so maybe this medication would be a better choice for you. And at the time, I didn't know much, and so I just trusted them. And then I started doing some independent research, starting reading some of these studies, and realized that her uh, understanding of migraine was outdated by about 20 years. So this is a real factor that migraine and headache sufferers need to keep in mind. You're only, your doctor is only as helpful as their education is current. Now, the second big thing I think that goes into doctors uh, in general not being competent about headache and migraine conditions is that it's pretty well understood, as I said, that migraine is a neurological problem. And we do have a class of physicians that deal specifically with neurological problems, and they're called neurologists. And so if you come in with a headache or migraine that doesn't seem responsive to most medical or sorry, most prescriptions that your doctor is going to put you on, your doctor doesn't really need to probably in their own mind do a lot more digging because it's a neurological problem. They have a specialist they can send you to. It's not something they need to focus on. And so I think that's probably a big reason that a lot of doctors don't do a lot of uh, outside or continuing education courses on headache or migraine because they probably think that if your medication doesn't work, they can send you to the neurologist and they'll do their thing. Again, I do have experience with this part of the problem also. When I first started getting chronic migraine, the first doctor I saw told me that, well, he gets migraines as well occasionally, about once every year, which I don't know why he felt like he was relating to me since I was getting about 20 a month at that time and have continued to. But okay, so you get one uh, every six months. And he said, you know, I just pop a Maxalt and it's a pretty good uh, medication. Here are some of the things to worry about. Here are some of the things to not do with it. But take a Maxalt and see if it helps. And after that didn't help, he tried a couple other abortive medications. We tried a couple prophylactic medications. And I kid you not, 
when I would come back after the medications didn't help or didn't help enough, he would simply pull out his medication book, look to the next line and prescribe that one. And then when we got to the bottom of the list, he said, well, it's time for you to see the neurologist. There's nothing else I can do. And so this kind of mentality that try medications and if they don't work, send to a neurologist seemed to be pretty uh, ingrained in at least some primary care physicians that you'll see. So you need to keep this in mind. Also, if they don't have a plan, if your physician doesn't have a plan beyond just go down the list of medications, it's probably a good indication you need a different doctor. Now, that doesn't mean that that doctor should get away with it. There might be some things that you could do to get them maybe not in trouble, but whoever employs them maybe needs to reorganize their educational processes and their continuing education processes so that they can provide that kind of education to their employees. But at the very least, you need to find a doctor you can trust. And this is a sign that you can't trust this particular doctor. <clears throat> now, let's move on here a little bit. So we've covered some of the stats about why there is ignorance about headache and migraine condition. We've talked about some of the reasons that a overall good physician might have for not getting more education about headache and migraine. Now what we're going to be talking about are some of the uh, things that you should be asking yourself. Here we go. Sorry, I had to scroll down on my notes. Um, so the things that you should probably be doing when you are worried, some questions to ask yourself, some questions to ask your physician when you're worried about whether or not your doctor is going to be the good uh, the, the best doctor for you. One thing you can do uh, is print off an article or a study that's been published in the last five or six years and bring it in to talk to your doctor about with. Uh, was that a sentence? Print off the article and bring it in to talk about with your doctor. There we go. I can organize sentences. What you uh, are doing here isn't trying to bring in a study and say, did you know about this? No, ah, you're a bad doctor. What you're doing is saying, I was doing some research and I found this article that said that three milligrams, for example, of melatonin is superior to preventing migraines in general versus amitriptyline. What do you think about this? You've got me on amitriptyline. Do you think we could also supplement some melatonin in there? And that provides a basis for discussion. And it also forces the doctor to look at some new information and hopefully be uh, inspired to look at some more studies in their own time. Now, additionally, there are review sites out there. This is the, you know, the age of the internet. And so there's review sites for lots and lots of topics and doctors are no different. Now, as I'm sure you know, this podcast is supported by the headachereview.com. And over at the headachereview.com, they have a listing of every state in the US and doctors recommended by the Migraine Research Foundation. If you don't like your medical professional, you can go to that site, the headachereview.com, leave a review stating honestly what your experience was with that doctor. If you do like your medical professional, you can go there and leave a review as well. And if your medical professional isn't listed there, you can submit the new, you can submit a, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? You can submit them as a new review item and I will get it posted for you there. This will help other people find out about good and bad doctors. And that's the kind of stuff we need. Additionally, you can also keep notes about what exactly your current medical professional has tried and what they did and didn't do that was helpful. This is really important, not just because you're trying to keep track of your doctor, but also because if you get moved on or passed on to a different doctor, that different doctor needs to know what your previous doctor did, not just what medications they put you on, but the things they told you, the advice that was given, and a lot of the details about how they were attempting to diagnose you. That is extremely important, and you need to keep good notes for your doctors. Now, final thing here to keep in mind when it comes to your medical professional and whether or not you should think about finding a new one is that you should never be afraid. You should never be afraid to tell your medical professional exactly what you're dissatisfied with and what you're satisfied with in regards to their care. Don't be derogatory or aggressive, of course. You're not trying to insult them or start a fight, but you should be clear and you should have examples. Also, you don't have to be afraid to call the network that employs this medical professional. I said this a little bit earlier. You don't have to be afraid to call and leave your complaint with whoever is in charge of patient relations. These places that have uh, 
uh, the power to hire and fire doctors care about whether or not they're going to have patients coming back to their network. And so if you say this doctor did not help me in this area, they can do one of two things. They could, of course, reprimand the doctor or they could say, well, this is an area that we need a continuing education course offered for. Maybe we should bring in someone from the American Mi uh, Migraine Foundation or the Migraine Trust or somewhere to have a, a professional who understands this stuff come in and teach our people what they should be doing better. All of this only happens when we speak up. Patient advocacy starts with the patient. You have to be able to grab your treatment by the reins and start to direct it a little bit. You can't prescribe your medications. You're not going to ever know as much as a doctor probably, but you and your doctor need to be on the same page. And that only happens when you are willing to speak up to your doctor. So I think that's probably the biggest takeaway today is to always be willing to talk to your doctor honestly and frankly. So I'm going to start ending these podcasts with a question. I like the interaction that I get on my YouTube channel. I like it when people ask questions there. I like it when people ask questions on the Migraine Guy uh, Facebook page. So I'm going to try and get uh, some listener interaction here with the podcast. So there's a number of ways to actually interact with me. You can, of course, uh, if you're looking at, if you're if you're listening to this podcast on theheadachereview.com, if you scroll to the bottom, there's a comment section there. Feel free to type any questions, comments, criticisms about what I have said. I always welcome that kind of information. If you're on Facebook, you can head over to the Migraine Guy page, like it, and leave a comment or question there. If you're on Twitter, you can always tweet at me at the migraine guy. Same thing if you're on Instagram. And of course, if you're watching uh, or listening, I guess, on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment there. So the question for today is, do you have a satisfactory relationship with your medical professional? If so, how did you find them? If not, what do you plan to do about it? Let me know the answers by contacting me on social media. Just search, as I said, for the migraine guy everywhere. Until next time, take it easy and remember, you are not alone.